And I say this with compassion and empathy that as spiritual workers, we're coming from such a good place from a place of altruism and truly wanting to help the planet and to help humanity. And we would never want to believe that maybe the um, entity that we've been working with to channel messages for humanity, we would never want to accept or believe that maybe it was a trickster. Because here's the mm. thing, these false light entities, whether it's a jinn or other kinds of tricksters, they love to work with channelers. They love to channel content to humanity. And here's where it gets really tricky, is that just like a sociopath or a psychopath human being would do if they were trying to trick someone, they would give 80% truth and very convincing truth and very lovely and comforting truth and 20% lies woven in. Wow. And that's, that's how the false light channeling works. Broaderlands Podcast. The opinions expressed on Broaderlands Podcast are those of the guest speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views of the host or Broaderlands Podcast. Maya, thank you for coming on Broaderlands Podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me, Boo Boo. And I've been really looking forward to meeting you because like I mentioned before the recording, I really love your energy. I love your your earnest truth seek seeking and um, you know, all the different guests that you have on the show. Uh, I just I love the energy of um of the the podcast and your energy as well. So thank you for having me. No, thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate the compliments. Uh uh, that means a lot. Thank you. Because um, it takes a lot of work to do this stuff. People don't realize that behind the scenes and all that. But uh, so I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Uh, I tend to screw things up when I introduce people. So maybe you can share a little about about you and what you do. Absolutely. And I totally get it. <laughs> so I'll go ahead <laughs> and introduce myself. And um, definitely feel free to interrupt if you want to hear, if you want to redirect so, hi everybody. My name is Maya Zahira. I'm a spiritual author and uh, teacher, mentor, guide. I've been working in uh, the field of spirituality as a mentor and teacher for really over 30 years. Um, however, my focus changed back in 2016 which I'll talk about, I'll circle back to in just a minute. Uh, but actually, I feel guided right now to go ahead and just go back to some uh, or, some origin story and just jump right in to that, because that's really important to know. Uh, whatever somebody's expertise is, I feel like it's really important to know, like, well, how do they know about this? Where did they get this knowledge from? And so for mm -hmm. me, it definitely comes from life experiences. So um, I am here to talk about all things psychic protection today. And that's a really big category. But when I um, was younger, I actually had my first experiences with, I didn't call it psychic protection back then. I didn't really know what it was, but um, I had some, you know, both positive and negative spiritual experiences as a kid. Uh, I was given up for adoption at birth and um, I was adopted. I was the youngest of five children and um, I was not the only adopted child, but the significant part about my family was that my adopted mother, in my professional opinion, at this point, from this vantage point, I believe she was demonically possessed. She was, um, well, at the time, they said she had some mental health issues. We're going to talk later, Boo Boo, about mental health an addiction and um, entity issues and how that all weaves together. But um, 
suffice it to say that she would have episodes where she would be having a normal conversation with me, just normal mom voice, normal mom talk. All of a sudden, she would stop mid-sentence. I would be sitting close enough to her that I could see her eyes. I could see her pupils would dilate down to the most impossible pinpoints, the tiniest pupils that you could ever imagine. And her voice would suddenly change to a male voice that was like this deep, growly male voice. And she would talk about how she wanted to kill herself, murder other people. Um, if I were to uh, present this to my other family members, they probably would deny it. Uh, I don't know. You know, that's just kind of how family unit units are. They tend to deny, deny certain secrets. Um, so that was the kind of environment that I grew up in. I was raised Catholic in my twenties. I stepped out of that box. I'm no, so I'm no longer Catholic, but, um, in my teenage years, that was when I had my first big spiritual awakening and I started to have spiritual visions, dream, um, premonition dreams, most of which were very positive positive. But I also started to have demonic experiences where I saw demons. Um, I had visitations when I was uh, most of the time at night when I was in bed. There were things that I saw. Uh, again, I didn't call it psychic protection issues. I, you know, it was just, oh, my gosh, there's a demon in my bedroom. Um, and I didn't really have a supportive family unit to help me. So I kind of just had to navigate it myself. Now, fast forward. Um even at that time in high school, I was uh, guiding other teenagers. And um, like I, there were some very large uh, religious and spiritual gatherings that I was a part of where I was guiding these very large groups in uh, prayer and meditation. So even as a teenager, I was in the role of um, guide. But then fast forward into my 20s, that's when I started to step into um, more of the new age culture. I became a Reiki master back before it was even really popular. Um, I was doing in, uh, work as an intuitive guide and as a teacher. And all of my work back in my 20s, 30s, and into my early 40s was all it's what what I call feel good spirituality. So I was into all of the like positive mm -hmm. empowerment and feel good and only focus on good things and don't focus on anything negative. And and then uh back in 2016, my rose colored glasses, my rose colored spiritual glasses were shattered uh, mm -hmm. when I encountered a major psychic attack. This psychic attack, this spiritual warfare that I experienced, it wasn't just a random thing. It was literally because I went to a colleague, a spiritual teacher who said that she channels angels. I went to her for a consultation to get a second opinion on some things. And after it, afterward, I came under major spiritual attack. So it turned it turns out that the angels that she thinks that she's working with are actually what I and other people refer to as false light entities. Hmm. I had no I had I had no knowledge of false light entities before this happened. Um and but there was a very negative it was actually a gin very negative entity, shapeshifter entity that was pretending to be a council of angels. For whatever reason, it was attacking me instead of with all the other followers of this teacher, it was digging in and doing the shapeshifting thing and um, trying to be their friend. With me, it was in attack mode. I don't know. It just felt um, threatened by me, but it took about six weeks for me to fully realize where this was coming from, what was going on, um, and how to clear it. But I want to bring up one really significant thing. 
when I was going through this attack that was way beyond anything I had even imagined, because at that point, I was deep in the belief that if you focus on positive energy and you have a positive vibe, then no negative entities or energies can ever touch you. If you're high vibe, I believed that fully. I was very into the new age movement. If you, if you focus on being high vibe, nothing negative can ever touch you. And so I was totally confused about why this was happening to me because I was high vibe. Why was this happening? But one of the really significant, another really significant thing that, that happened was when I reached out to my community for help, when I reached out to my spiritual colleagues, many of them gaslit me by telling me that, <clears throat> that there was no entity, that it was simply a part of my unhealed shadow. And that, my friends, is gaslighting. That is spiritual gaslighting. Now, is it possible for someone to have unhealed shadow and for things uh, for uncomfortable things to happen. Yes, that's possible. Many of us are projecting our shadows all over the place. But in my case, this was definitely an entity. It actually showed up on one of my, vi the, the entity itself, the spiritual pulsating energy showed up on a video that I took for some of my students, an educational video. That entity showed up over my shoulder that is not a projection of my shadow. That is a real freaking thing. <laughs> it also woke me up in the middle of the night. Uh, I My eyes flew open and it was above me and it tried to tear my soul out of my body. That hmm. is not unhealed shadow. So I eventually, as you might imagine, um, it was, I, I eventually was able to clear this issue I had to figure out, first of all, um, I had to learn even what gin were. I didn't even know what they were back then. Somebody suggested that I could be dealing with a gin issue. And I said, no, I'm not, because I don't, don't even know what that is. Turned out it was a gin. So even if you don't believe in something or even know, it can still show up in your world. So I, I was able to clear it. Um, in the years following that issue, I ended up um, attracting a lot of people who needed help with psychic protection issues. And the reason was I started doing videos and speaking out about the experience that I had had and all of the gaslighting I had experienced in the New Age community. And so by speaking out, there were all these people coming forward and um, who had been struggling for years and they were being gaslit by healers and shamans being told that their situation wasn't real. And so I ended up creating a free Facebook group and a, uh, a online community. I ended up creating a paid academy to mentor people through these issues. So it's been quite a journey. And um, now I have two books and a third one on the way, all about psychic protection issues. And th there we go. That's the origin story of uh, why I'm here talking to you today, Boo Boo, sharing everything and how I know what I know. I will um, emphasize this part, that there was something that happened in the months following the psychic attack. I noticed that I was having these mega spiritual downloads of information and understanding and truth about psychic protection. Because as I mentioned a couple of times, the colleagues around me were not very helpful. They, they had beliefs that were not helpful for the kind of situation that I was going through. And yet I was getting these spiritual downloads that were showing me truths, all this information. And I would start having conversations with people that were like hours long conversations. And I remember one time I stopped and I thought, how do I know this? I didn't read this in a book. Um, I didn't get this from any teachers. This is straight download. So uh, there were these downloads. And the other thing that happened was um, I, as a result of that trauma, of that like literally life and death trauma with that false light entity, specifically a jinn. 
I developed and have a super strong spidey sense for determining false light entities, which entities are genuine and which entities are tricksters. I want to say that that doesn't make me more special. I don't think I'm enlightened or anything like that. Ever, so, some people have a gift as a concert pianist and they're amazing at that. And that, that doesn't make them any better as a human being, you know, like we all, we just all have gifts. And I really think that it was the trauma of the, the life and death situation that turned on that gift for me. Um, so I'm, tr nowadays I'm trying to teach people how to identify these kinds of trickster entities, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get into a little bit more today. Thank you for listening to my long tirade. I can really <laughs> get on my soapbox. No, no, I appreciate <laughs> it. I really do. And, uh, yeah. you, know, you know, um, maybe for those who may not have heard of the gin, maybe you can kind of yeah. explain what, what the gin is, if you don't mind. Um, I've heard yeah. them, people connect them with the Anunnaki. I, I've heard people talk about mm. the Jan, the Archons, and other types of entities. This has always been coming from different cultures. Um, but cool. yeah, maybe you can uh, give us a little bit more, a uh, little, mm. little bit more about the Jan, if you don't mind. Yeah, and absolutely. Are. And you've piqued my interest. I'm going to talk to you later about any videos. Uh, that you can recommend about connecting the jinn to the Anunnaki and the uh, and et cetera, because um, I'm I'm still learning more. The knowledge that I have is the firsthand encounters, right? So I've had at this point multiple encounters with jinn because not only did I have that first encounter, but I've had a few others, which we don't really have time to get into today, plus clients who've had gen issues. So what I'm going to share with you now is based on firsthand combat with them. And so I will start off generally speaking, saying that the concept of jinn comes from the Quran and from Middle Eastern culture. But please don't ever think that these are entities that are only hanging out in the Middle East because I work with people uh, all over the world online and I've, I have um, worked with clients all over who have had gin problems, who've mm -hmm. had gin um, entities attacking them. And these are people that are not necessarily in the Middle East and, and I've personally encountered uh, me personally, not with client sessions, sessions, but I've personally encountered uh, a major powerful gin in Kansas City. I encountered one in Tucson, Arizona, mm. and I haven't done that much traveling, but who knows? You know, they're they're mm. they're everywhere. So these are entities that are all over the planet, not just the Middle East. They are made of. What the jinn refers to, what, what the Quran refers to as flameless fire, which we can think of as plasma. So it's like this pulsating electrical energy. That's their true form. And so uh, as a clairvoyant, I've seen them in their true form. So that when I mentioned that the jinn was attacking me that one night, that it tried to tear my soul out of my body, it actually appeared in its true form in this pul pulsating energy hovering above me. However, most of the encounters that I've had, I've seen it in shape-shifted form. And jinn can can pretend to be one entity or multiple entities. For example, a council of angels, a council of ben supposed benevolent aliens. This is where it gets really confusing for people. They say, well, how could this be a shapeshifter when there's 12 beings appearing to me? No, it's one entity pretending to be multiples. Now, the jinn are the only type of spiritual being that I have seen that can shapeshift into multiple beings because demons, evil spirits, and other types of beings can do the shapeshifter trickster thing. I've never seen any of them be capable of this like multiple angels, multiple fairies, multiple alien beings type of scenario. So again, mm -hmm. their, their true form is plasma 
but they can shape shift into anything from loved ones or supposedly loved ones, not actually your loved ones, um, ascended masters. They, they love to pretend to be ascended master so-and-so. They, they love to um, pretend to be um, holy masters like Jesus, Mary Magdalene, Buddha, etc. So they, they pretend because they love to be worshiped. They love that worship energy. They also love chaos energy to create fear, but they love worship energy just as much. They, they will shape shift in, into angels, into fairies, into animals, you name it they can shape shift into it. So it can get very confusing where it feels like your reality is bending because you might have an experience where you see, uh, oh, and I've seen them shape shift into demons. So they're, 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 they're like wow. a real work of art. So you could have an experience where you see a demon and then you see an angel and then you, and they're, they're doing this whole mind F on you to where you don't even know which way is up. So they're masters of uh, shape-shifting and masters of chaos. You definitely don't want to run into one of them. Um, I, Like I said, I ran into one accidentally in Tucson. I told a colleague of mine about it and, and she said, oh, don't worry about that. I would still go in there. I'll protect you. And I'm like, no, in my opinion, jinn are worse than demons. Mm -hmm. I will say that again and again, because they are true psychopaths that do not respond to boundaries. I had a jinn issue um, several years ago, different than the story that I already told. And I set very strong boundaries with it. I, I did the whole thing of like making the proclamation, you need to leave. That thing blasted me so bad and it murdered my cat. Uh, I mean, the, the wow. lashback, the backlash was horrendous. That was a very uh, difficult but valuable lesson that I took forward as I work with clients. I now know if you're dealing with a gin, you're not going to approach it the same as you do with a demon at infestation. With demons, you can get in their face and yell at them to leave. Uh, with evil spirits, you can do the same. With gin, you kind of have to take this backdoor approach of um, like secretly clearing out core wounds, shadow, like doing all the shadow work, clearing out past lives, wherever that gin was able to originally attach you clear that and then it can't attach anymore but you can't just go straight at it or you'll get blasted so that's what i have to say about gin wow um mm -hmm. you just like really opening up a whole new whole new i all these <laughs> ideas are coming to me i can't even talk <laughs> um but uh yeah thank you um you brought up a uh, um it could uh, shape shift into an angel or a demon. And yeah. then, uh, you know, I talked to you about Kate Montana's book, uh, um, cracking the matrix. And, yeah. uh, she has a drawing of that old cartoon. Remember where there'd be a little angel and a little demon. Yes. And then she has exercises on how to protect yourself from that. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you brought that up. I'm like, damn, like, how do you know which what's authentic and what's not, what's, what's false light mm -hmm. and, and what's mm -hmm. real. Um, because I've, I've interviewed a number of people on, on here that like tap into like a, a, a like a, a group of entities that are like angels or whatever, and, and, or, or one. Uh, but um, how do you know that's not a false light or is it loving? Because they can also pretend to be loving and kind, right? I've heard yes. you say that before. Yes. So it's kind of scary. Let's talk about that. <laughs> Yeah. So I've got some info for you, boo boo. All right. <laughs> so let's talk about how do you tell, how do you truly determine if it's false light? So I have a list of things, but before I go into the, the list of things to look out for, I'm going to preface it by giving some compassionate, tough love to the audience. Because I've, I've helped a lot of people and I've also worked with a lot of colleagues uh, in the spiritual field who I will tell them, here's 
here's something that's going on that's identifying that this is false light and they don't want to believe it when it applies to them. Mm. And hey, I get it. There, there's this term called cognitive dissonance. It's yeah. when our brain just doesn't want to believe what we're being presented with. And also, mm. and I say this with compassion and empathy, that as spiritual workers, we're coming from such a good place from a place of altruism and truly wanting to help the planet and to help humanity. And we would never want to believe that maybe the um, entity that we've been working with to channel messages for humanity, we would never want to accept or believe that maybe it was a trickster. Because here's the mm -hmm. thing. These false light entities, whether it's a jinn or other kinds of tricksters, they love to work with channelers. They love to channel content to humanity. And here's where it gets really tricky, is that just like a sociopath or a psychopath human being would do if they were trying to trick someone, they would give 80% truth and very convincing truth and very lovely and comforting truth and 20% lies woven in. Wow. And that's, that's how the false light channeling works. So my, my message of compassionate, compassion and empathy is, you know, just take these um, false light red flags that I'm going to share, take it in, try to integrate it and uh, be kind and compassionate with yourself and just really be open to questioning. Is every single one of your spirit guides legit? Is mm. everything that you're channeling legit? Because it's not serving humanity or anybody if you're stuck in the cognitive dissonance. Because I'm, I'm going to say something really controversial, and it's that from my vantage point, again, I have this, I'm a little bit ahead of the curve right now still with being able to discern false light a little bit better than everyone else, but I'm trying to help everyone catch up to me. Uh, I will say this controversial statement, and it's that most, most of what's being channeled right now on the planet, these spiritual messages, is coming from false light trickster entities. So... Let me go ahead and share some different um, things that you want to watch out for that could indicate that you're dealing with false light. The first thing is that because it's false light and it's not an authentic light being, false light tends to try to overcompensate. It o tries to overcompensate. So a being that's not genuinely a light being will try to overcompensate by being extra bright, extra shiny, extra um, loud. So if anybody's watching is a clairvoyant and tends to see spiritual energies, if what you see is like this huge, bright, shining light or this huge entity and it's like over the top, over the top, clear, over the top, bright, that is a red flag that you're probably dealing with false light because genuine, real spiritual connection tends to be more subtle. It tends mm. to be more subtle. Those of you who are watching who tend to be clairaudient, who have uh, the ability to hear spiritual energies, you might hear your supposed um, uh Ascended being or a uh, spirit guide that's talking to you and it's very loud and it's in a very loud booming voice. That is classic gin. I've, I've had again, multiple encounters with gin and they have the loud, the loudest voices I have ever heard. And it usually come, the gin usually communicate telepathically. It comes right in or it goes right in your clear audience ear. And you hear it super loud. So if you start getting messages that are like clear as day, auditory, it's some type, it's either a gin or some other type of false light being. Because again, if your angels, your true angels are communicating with you, it's going to be more subtle. You have to pay closer attention. It comes more through a feeling within you or maybe a very mm. soft voice. 
Okay. Um, let's see. I'm just looking at my notes because I know. All right. So there's another indication of false light. And I see this misinformation misinformation online a lot on social media. There's this idea that a high-pitched sound frequency, that if you start hearing high-pitched sound frequencies, that this means that there's high vibrations. And I used to believe that. I used to think that that was the case until I had my first gin run in. And what I have uh, observed again and again is that whenever a jinn or another false light entity is present, they show up and you hear a high pitch frequency. So if you hear that high pitch frequency, take, uh, pay attention. There could be something happening. The other thing is, is if you are channeling uh, messages for humanity or you're just getting your own messages for your life, and you um, have incidences where your guardian angel, your guide, your whoever leads you astray and they tell you to do something that actually gets you into trouble. That's another red flag. And I've worked with multiple people. So I've worked with people who ended up going to jail because they listened to what the false light entity was telling them to do and they got in legal trouble because they were being messed with. And I'll give one more indicator. There's, there are several that I talk about in my book, the Psychic Attack Source book. But here's another one that I think can apply to everyone, whether you're a spiritual worker or just a spiritual seeker. So those of you who do meditation, working with your spirit guides, this, this is a, a really common thing that happens is when you're in meditation and you're getting this lovely image, maybe in your mind's eye, or maybe clairvoyantly, you're actually seeing it. You're seeing your guide and there, or this ascended master that you think is your guide. And for a split moment, their facade slips. This happens a lot. I've worked with a lot of clients who've said, Maya, I needed to, to have a session with you because I had this weird situation where I was working with Ascended Master so-and-so who I thought was my guide. And for a split moment, like barely even a millisecond, all of a sudden they looked scary. And then a millisecond later, they went back to looking like their beautiful self. Wow. So that, I will say this to all of you, that is, as I point, as I wag my finger, that is all you need to know. If the facade slips for a millisecond, that is your answer. You saw the truth. Mm. Thank you. Uh, can I ask mm -hmm. you a question? Uh, sure. Because, you know, a lot of times in the New Thought community, uh, yeah. You hear it's just everything's just God. There's no other. There is no devil because then there would be different forces. And you know, I hear that a lot in like different communities. I don't think I should name them. But uh, well, actually, there was a minister in a religious science saying, you know, there can be no other thing but God. Everything is one. But well, so where is God in all this? I mean, you hear in the book of Isaiah, he says, I am the Lord. You know, um, I create light and I create darkness. I create peace and I create evil. I, the Lord, do all things. And I don't think the Bible is the word of God, but I mean, there's some truth in it, but there's some stuff that's, uh, you know, um, I think it con contradicts itself and, you know, uh, other agendas. But um, but there are some jewels in, in, in there as well. But I, I don't know what to think about that verse. Um, how do you I mean, because there's obviously dark entities. There's obviously evil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And. Where's God yeah. in this whole thing? <laughs> I have some thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, you know, these are my thoughts based on my experiences. I also lovingly recognize every, everyone has their beliefs. I don't need everyone to believe everything that I do. So I acknowledge that there are plenty of people on the planet who have a very firm, strong belief that negative entities do not exist. That everything is divine, therefore everything is good. And I, I, I'm going to just ramble about this for a little bit and, and feel free to jump in, share your own thoughts. So the first, th the first thing that pops into my head is that I have a whole chapter in the Psychic Attack Source book that's 
all about the the myths about psychic protection, all of the myths about spiritual warfare. And one of the myths that I address is this idea that negative entities do not exist, that everything is God and therefore everything is good. And the, from my perspective, the problem that happens that I've seen it again and again is that people who believe that negative entities don't exist tend to be the biggest target of negative entities and false light entities. Mm -hmm. As someone who can see entities and, and identify false light entities, and also someone who's a spiritual worker who hangs out at psychic fairs, big events with lots of colleagues, I, um, in person, will encounter people who will say to my face, so people who are doing spiritual work professionally, uh, full time. So it's not just a hobbyist thing. So they're, they're very experienced in their work. They have this firm belief that negative entities don't exist. And I'm, I'm being respectful because I believe we all have the freedom to believe whatever. And I'm looking at them and I'm seeing that the, these entities that they are channeling to bring forth their psychic messages for their clients are false light entities. And so I just nod and I go, okay. You know, and there was literally one instance last year where I walked into a psychic fair that was that I had participated in for years. And um, this particular one was at a new location. I walked in and I looked up because I was immediately was drawn to look up at the ceiling and I saw a huge portal around the area of the ceiling and, and um, tons of demonic activity. So, of mm. course, we know there's a lot of different kinds of negative entities at this particular event. It was just like demons. It was like the flying monkey um, gargoyle creature type of demons flying above the whole group of people who thought they were at this uplifting psychic fair. And I pulled one of my colleagues aside, a lovely lady that I'm still friends with. And, and I pulled her aside and I said, look up there. And, and she said, I don't see anything. And I said, there's a portal and there's thousands of demons flying around. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me with all seriousness and she said, demons don't exist. Negative entities don't exist. And I said, okay. You know, um, so she, her experience is different. I have had people ask me, you know, if somebody is a gifted psychic, because I was surrounded by colleagues who are good at helping their clients, if they're gifted, how come they can't see this? Um, I think that that's a really good existential question. <laughs> I don't know if I have the answer to it, but I, I have a thought on it. And it's that I think some people are really tuned in to certain frequencies where they can tune in to certain things and other people can um, sense other things. Um, and um, this is like both a gift and a curse for me that I can see uh, ever since I was young, I could see demons, I could see all sorts of entities. Um, and actually there's a woman at that particular psychic fair that works with, with genuine angels. And I remember looking over her at her kind of longingly thinking, Oh, it must be so nice. You know, cause like I see things that are really, dis I see angels too, but I see things that are really disturbing. I see the whole spectrum and, um, you know, it's, it can be very unpleasant. So the whole idea of like, there is only God, <laughs> how I hear that is, yeah. And that's just a belief. Like it's not, it doesn't mean that it's true. It's mm. something that some people believe. I also think that. Um, sometimes as human beings, we cling to beliefs that are comforting because sometimes the truth is really disturbing. Wow. You know, in, in the term trickster is not a new term. That's an ancient term. They would call yeah. certain beings tricksters, magicians. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so uh, even yeah. shapeshifters, you know. Um, so, yeah. yeah, you're really giving me a lot of food for thought. One thing I wanted to ask you was about addiction. You know, um, when people yeah. are stuck in addiction, it's like these beings these are like parasites to the, to the soul or whatever. Um, when people are, uh, have a lot of trauma, 
a lot of fear, a lot of hate, a lot of anger, a lot of shame, and all that all that negative energy, does that make them more prone more, or more tastier to these entities mm. and okay. easier so to I'm be hear- controlled by? I'm hearing a couple di- different levels here. So we're talking about addiction, but also if they have a lot of shame and a lot of trauma, does that make them an easier target for for entity attachments? So we're kind of... So, so I want to make sure I understand because we're kind of talking about, um, like it could be all together, but a separate thing. So I'll, I, well, um, I'll go ahead and address that. I'll, I'll, I'll kind of clarify what I meant because yeah. I don't think you can have be an addict like like a, a an alcoholic or a yeah. heroin addict without the trauma piece, some kind yeah. of trapped emotions and hurt and pain. So that's why I kind of put it all together. Okay, um, but. Uh, you- yeah, and you don't have to agree, but I, I that's kind of like what I've. I've no, I've, uh, I do agree. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. So, um, all right. So, when it comes to addiction and entity issues, I'll I'll kind of try to unwind this for all of us. So. Uh, now we all know, I mean, I think everybody knows I'm not a mental health spe- specialist and I'm not a an addiction specialist, but my specialty is in spirituality. So from this perspective, I have worked with a lot of people in recovery, in, in addiction recovery, and there are some things that I've noticed. So in my perspective, there are a couple of causes of the addiction issues. So part of it can be a genetic predisposition. And then add to that life traumas and um, self-esteem and some of the mental health issues that tie into that, that then draw the person even closer to addiction issues. There's a third possible cause And this can be that a person can be at a point where they're not even actively yet involved in the addiction, but there is an entity or entities around that can sense that potential in the person's energy field. And then they hook into the person, into the person's energy field in order to encourage the addictive behavior to begin. Or if it's a case where the addictive behavior has already started, and and then after that is when the entity or entities come into the picture, then those entities will work to worsen the addiction. So then we have uh, whether it's demonic entities or um, human souls who were addicted to whatever substance or behavior when they were living. Uh, so demons and, and addicted human souls are the two most common entities that I see attached to people who are dealing with addiction. Although, of course, there's always other things that can attach as well. Um, but those two types of entities have different reasons for attaching to the person. When it comes to demons, or other types of really dark entities, they love to feed off of the energy of suffering. So they want to encourage whatever the either the addictive behavior or the harmful behavior is in order to feed off of that energy of suffering. When it comes to discarnate human souls attached to an addict, they are wanting to... Um, activate and encourage the person, the living person, to participate in the addictive behavior so that the entity, so that the discarnate human soul can step into the body, especially like, let's say the person gets blackout drunk. So when they go blackout, that's when the entity steps in and they get to experience the addiction within the person's body. And so these are very troubled human souls that that really need help and rehabilitation because they're hurting living souls or living people. And then when it comes to a point, the point of recovery, if someone is actively working on their recovery, 
I firmly believe that they need not only the, the, the social support, like the 12 step program or whatever program where they have community helping them and a sponsor and, uh, working with a therapist. So mental health support to work on addressing the root causes, some of the, the traumas but that they also need to work on the spiritual. So they need to seek out a healer or a shaman who's well-versed in working with clearing out entity attachments. In all my years of spiritual work, there has, li has literally been only a single one person who was in recovery that I met who didn't have tons of entities attached to her. And she just had just a special kind of energy where she was extra protected. Every single other client I have ever worked with, they needed major entity extraction. And again, not just of demons and disturbed human souls, but all sorts of other stuff came in, um, you know, astral parasites and just all sorts of other funky stuff came into their field as a result of all of this psychic distortion. So, so they needed a lot of spiritual cleansing and uh, spiritual rehabilitation and repair. Wow. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of times in the 12 step communities, you know, and it's crazy uh, because you just explained me when I was drunk, um, I would turn into a different person. They call that Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde in the mm -hmm. AA world. Uh, in the big book uh but uh yeah that was me i like i was being really evil really um um violent like like all that took over me um and but uh i, I like what you said oh, we need a, a number of things to have fully recover and heal and and, uh, and and change because a lot of times in the 12 step community they'll say all that other stuff's outside issues we don't even talk about it i think they should embrace it go hand in hand with each other to be more helpful to the addict suffering, you know, but, uh, yeah, I appreciate you saying that because there may be other stuff. I don't think the 12 steps has all the answers that it's helpful with mm -hmm. the community and the learning how to live on a spiritual basis, but others may need a therapist and shaman and so on. So yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> what yeah. about ayahuasca? And that's pretty popular and people tap mm -hmm. into these different entities. Um, uh, What's your understanding on that? Yeah, I don't, I'm smiling really big because I definitely have an opinion on it. <laughs> um, and um, my opinion is not not so popular with some people, but I'm not here to be popular. I'm just here to share whatever <laughs> my truth is. Uh, so first, I want to say I personally have not done an ayahuasca journey. Uh, nor have I done any kind of halluc hallucinogenics. And that has just been a choice of mine because I've always just innately known that it would put me in a very vulnerable state, that mm. I um, was not interested in, in having the, the side effects that I'm going to talk about. Um, also, I feel that as someone who's in a healing and uh, in, in a healer capacity, it is my responsibility to show up with energy that's totally clean and clear. And if I go to a, an ayahuasca journey and come back infested with stuff, and then I'm working with clients, that's definitely bad juju. Mm -hmm. So that's why I've chosen to not do it. Uh, but I have my personal opinions and I have many clients that I've worked with who have gone on high on ayahuasca journeys or other types of journey uh, of of medicine journeys and they have ended up coming to me um and that's that's a funny not funny laugh there mm. uh they've they've ended up coming to me because they've had major spiritual attachments entity attachments and all sorts of weird things that they've needed help with after the journey it's my opinion that m the most and i say this with respect to all my colleagues out there that most <laughs> people who are leading ayahuasca journeys they they don't have anywhere near the the knowledge or the know-how to keep their uh people safe 
during the ceremony, spiritually safe. And in my humble opinion, in order to keep them safe, they would need to have clear, clairvoyant, clairaudient, clairsentient abilities to be able to see entities. Because if you're, you can't, then you're a teacher who's blind. Um, and there are many wonderful teachers out there and guides. Uh, they don't all have to be psychic or clairvoyant. But if you're going to guide people in a ceremony that could potentially be this dangerous, I think it, I think you have to have those abilities developed. If you don't have those, those abilities, you need to develop them and to be able to develop, to also develop the, um, spiritual strength to hold space for your circle, whether it's an ayahuasca journey or a sound healing concert or a yoga class, whatever this applies to all of this, that a spiritual leader a spiritual facilitator needs to be able to feel and identify what's going on in the energy of the space. And they need to have the spiritual abilities to move out any negative energies or entities. Now, this also can be that someone who's attending the circle has stuff attached to them. So it's not just coming out from mm -hmm from the woods, you know, can be coming from someone else in the group and then attaching to someone else. And it's just this big intermingling of entities and, and dark shadows and also our unhealed wounds. So getting back to ayahuasca, when you have all these people who are in a room together who are journeying, it's only natural for our unhealed inner shadow energies mm -hmm. to come up as well as any entity attachments, uh, any negative energies, all of the things end up getting intermingled with the group. And so people end up coming home with basically spiritual STDs. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so they're burning. Yeah. So <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. I've only worked with one client over the years who had, who found an ayahuasca guide that she was going to work with one-on-one. -on -one. And this, this ayahuasca teacher uh, is someone who's very grounded and is um, very well-versed in spiritual safety. So mm. I told her, okay, I think it might be okay in this circumstance. So it probably sounds like I'm very opinionated about this, but I'm not saying it could never be possible to have a good Aya journey, but I think there are just too many factors that are normal areas of danger, like um, any, any drug use. Now, I forgot to say this before. I, I believe in freedom to choose. So I'm not anti-drug. I think it should all be legalized. Uh, but also from the work that I've done, what I've seen again and again is that use of substances ends up creating distortions in a person's energy field. And I'm talking about all sorts of substances. So I'm all for freedom and people do whatever they want, uh, but just have the knowledge that it does create distortions in a person's energy field. And if a person has had experiences with being spiritually targeted, if they have experiences where they've, they've had spiritual warfare, they've had entity attachments, or uh, they've had unwanted paranormal experiences, et cetera, those kinds of people who've experienced spiritual targeting in the past would need to be extra careful and really thoughtful about whether they're going to be using any substances or not. Again, it's up to each person, but take, take this information uh, as you make the decision for yourself. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, you got me thinking about spiritually hijacked. If we can get spiritually hijacked basically as an individual, can that yeah. also happen as a, at a collective level? Oh yeah. 
<laughs> oh, yeah. So let's talk about spiritual hijacking. I was thinking about this topic earlier, and it occurred to me that it might make more sense to talk about two different terminologies at the same time. So I'm going to define a couple of things and lay it all out for us. So there's a term that I created a couple of years ago called secondary psychic attack. Hmm. So a primary psychic attack is when dark forces or somebody sending black magic to you directly or an entity is attacking you directly. It's all very direct. But that's a primary psychic attack. It's coming right at you. A secondary psychic attack is when the other people in your world are the ones being attacked, but you're actually the target. So let's say your loved one, your your partner is getting nudged by the entity that's in your world. It's getting nudged. So So your partner is getting nudged to mess with you. Your partner is getting nudged mm. through telepathic thoughts, feelings, to say the thing that's going to hurt you. Or to do something to sabotage you, like misplace your keys on the day of your big job interview, or even put you in danger uh, in some way, shape, or form. Like they, they get nudged to veer the car off into the other lane or something like that. So this is where entities and dark forces can nudge human beings, not just our loved ones, but even complete strangers, co-workers. So literally... Anyone, now we're going to get to your term that you were asking about, the um, spiritually hijacked. Anyone can be spiritually hijacked, whether it's for a moment or long term. And another term that we might think of to define spiritually hijacked would be uh, that they become an agent smith. Agent mm. Smith, as in from the Matrix movies, where this this uh, Agent Smith that's part of the, the Matrix program literally takes over people. Of course, in the movie, as he takes over people, then he, then uh, he the person then looks like Agent Smith. But in real life, in this Matrix, when somebody gets taken over, they still look like your Uncle Joe or whoever. <laughs> Uh, but they're acting, the way that they're acting is not coming from themselves. It's coming from some outside force. Now, sometimes it could be that they already have some normal troublesome behavior. Let's say Uncle Joe already has anger issues. That's part of his personality. Well, then this outside spiritual force is going to um, activate and turn up the volume on those anger issues, that entity or whatever force is going to amplify those issues even more. So I actually lived with somebody a couple of years ago as a, as a roommate who was constantly getting hijacked and um, eventually to the point where it seemed to me that she was hijacked all the time because her eyes, like her personality completely changed. Her eyes became vacant. Like I would look at her and it was like spaced out eyes, like she wasn't even there. And she started moving like a robot, like mm. something else was moving her. Uh, that was my first encounter with something that I now call a total takeover. Like this person was completely taken over. Most of my observations were, um, you know, I'd be walking along the street and all of a sudden a stranger would say something weird or a homeless person would start to jump, like to try to attack me. Um, and that's all an example of a secondary psychic attack where uh, here's the main target, the targeted individual, spiritually targeted individual, and there are spiritual forces utilizing people, hijacking those individuals to attack whoever the target is. So I, I'm getting this feeling right now that those of you who are watching and listening to this are suddenly thinking about circumstances in your life. Like, oh my gosh, I wonder if that was a situation of secondary psychic attack. Like my partner sometimes acts completely out of character 
or the person at work or whatever. There's a whole chapter on secondary psychic attack and this like Agent Smith phenomenon in my second book, The Psychic Attack Source Book, if anybody feels like they want to understand that a little bit more. Does that all make sense? Do you have any more questions about that? Oh, yeah, it does make sense. And, I, you know, I apologize for not having your books. I usually try to have um, your books uh, right in back of me but and read them. But uh, it's been I've been getting so many people I can't keep. <laughs> but uh, I know. Uh, and hey, I, hey, um, Boo Boo, I've seen how many amazing interviews that you're putting out. And so I didn't even offer to send you a book because I was like, he that guy is so amazingly busy. But I'd be happy to send you one if you you know, if you want to ask for one later, but I don't yeah, expect I, you to have read the books. You, you would have to be reading how, like what, 20 books a week or something like that. <laughs> yeah. No, I look forward to reading your books though, to be honest. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'll definitely buy them on Amazon Great. You know, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to ask you really quick. Uh, your, what's your understanding of an egregore? That's funny. I looked at my notes and I was like, that's what we're going to talk about next. Egregore. Okay, so let's do a little bit of definitions in case there's anybody um, listening who doesn't quite, who isn't quite clear on what an egregore is. Let me backtrack and talk about thought form entities, also known as tulpa. A thought form entity is uh, it's a it's an energy that that uh, somebody or either an individual or a group of people can focus their intent, uh, mental and spiritual energy on creating an entity. So a thought form energy, a thought form entity or a tulpa could be created by a magician or a practitioner of um, and any type of esoteric practices where they're trying to create something either to psychically to, to have that thought form entity go out and psychically attack their target, or sometimes a magician will create a thought form entity or a witch will create a thought form entity to be a, a helper, to be a, 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 a servitor is the word, to assist them in their magical work. So not necessarily to attack people, but to help them or even protect to send out as a protector. So um, just one more word on general thought form entities is that um, I've actually seen people who thought that they had a demon attached to them or some other type of entity. And it actually was, it turned out to be a thought form entity that somebody had sent to attack them. And in my experience, thought form entities are way easier to clear than the act than actual entities. So if it's a, a thought form entity that's made to look like a demon, it's a lot easier to clear than an actual demon. Because they they it's like they're not fully formed most of the time. And you can just clear them out. When it comes to an egregore, this is like thought form entity on steroids. This mm. is actually a, a spiritual being that's created by the by a group of people, a larger group of people, and sometimes even the collective of humanity. So when you sent your email with notes recently, and I saw uh, this topic on the list, I was thinking the, ma the main thing that came to my mind was the idea that there are various religions in our world where the main focus of the religion is a particular deity, a god or goddess. And so there are all of these people focusing intent, attention, prayers, and worship on this deity. So as an open-minded skeptic, that's what I call myself, I'm a questioner, I, mm. uh, it makes me think, now I don't say that I have the answer to this, but my, my spiritual nerd brain loves thinking about the fact that I wonder if some of these gods and goddesses are actually, have never been actually real, but they are egregores. They are thought form entities 
created by the collective of which whatever culture is believing in that being. And I am uh, not excluding uh, Christianity and some of the Western beliefs. So I'm not just referring to uh, belief systems on the other side of the globe from me. I mean, th this can apply to any of our religions. Now, I'm not saying definitively that such and such a uh, master doesn't exist or Jesus or Buddha or Lakshmi or uh, whatever Hindu god, gods or goddesses or whoever. I'm not saying that they definitely don't exist, but it's it's an interesting idea to ponder that what if, what if they are actually a construct of of humanity's thought thought forms thoughts that have been made into reality what do you think about that no i think about that all the time mm -hmm. uh, so i appreciate you saying that mm -hmm. you know i'm not alone <laughs> uh, yeah no, yeah that's I, I always have that in my mind you know and mm -hmm. um and it, it could be something positive as well and it can be something negative right Yes, yeah. yes, uh -huh. that that's a really good point. That that a, that an egregore can be uh, even a negative entity. It's not just these like positive deity figures. It can be something negative, like even the idea of the devil. Yeah, you're right. And, you yeah. know, and you see these religious groups right now. Even today, there's wars right going on. Mm -hmm. You know, there's hatred amongst each other, and that could be a negative entity or thought form. You know, controlling this collective. Like, and like it does as an individual, it also does it at a collective level. You see it in the politics and stuff like that. So, yeah, yeah I absolutely believe that <laughs> I, as far as wars and discord and all, all the negative things going on on the planet. When when um, when I look clairvoyantly at the planet as a whole, I see it's like there's there's different areas of the planet that have this like dark shadowy energy that that's essentially we could call it a thought form entity or an egregore it's a collective it's like this collective mass fear and fighting um and uh you know competition us against them and greed and all of these things that then it's like this feedback loop that entity or energy then feeds back into the collective and it just encourages you know, even more war and discord among the communities. Yeah. And I think uh, Eckhart Tolle called it a collective ego, mm. or, you know, unconscious collective. Um, yes. Yeah. I remember that. I, I read some of his books. It's been years. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. Of course. I guess that ended up in a somewhat of a positive note. <laughs> like how do we protect ourselves? How do we protect ourselves mm. from, from, uh, from anything. I know Yogananda once said, uh, nothing could touch you if you inwardly love God. But um, mm -hmm. it, it's like, are we, because you said, even if we're like completely centered in self, we still can be attacked. Or we got to yes. always be mindful, aware, conscious, mm -hmm. uh, always doing shadow work, constantly mm -hmm. working on ourselves, praying, meditating. Exactly. I, I don't know. Uh, so uh, yeah. how do we protect ourselves from all this? Yeah, this, this is a great way to um, bring it full circle. Uh, before talking about some of the empowered ways that you can protect yourself, I'll first uh, just emphasize that you know, focusing on love and light and being in a state of God presence or whatever you want to call it, it doesn't protect people. And that that's my hard truth that, that I share with people. In fact, most of the clients and students that have come to me over the years have been in a state of existential crisis because they truly believed that nothing could hurt them and then something did. So mm -hmm. here are some words of encouragement and empowerment. So even though it's um, a fact that you don't have total control of your reality at all times, and even if you are high vibe, being high vibe is a good thing, but it can also attract darker energies that are threatened by that light. So this is why it's important that all, all of us truth seekers and light bearers, that we all op 
open our mind enough to see certain truths that might be uncomfortable. So my first su suggestion of empowerment is to work, do your shadow work. And as you're doing your inner work on your traumas, that's going to help you to release some of the fear because fear is what stops you from looking at the dark and you must be courageous enough and anchored enough and healed enough to be able to look at the dark. If you close your eyes and don't look at it, then you are vulnerable. So you must be courageous enough and, and willing to really seek and see truth to be able to open your eyes and look at it and say, this is darkness and this is uh, there, it's on the planet. And, and I also acknowledge for myself that it doesn't have control over me because when you close your eyes, then you give it control. So you open your eyes and you face it down. You look at it, you learn about it, you read books so I would say a good starting point would be the Psychic Attack source book to learn all about how all of this works. So, so face the truth. Don't be in denial. Don't stick your head in the sand. Um, and then also my second little uh, bit of empowerment that I would le leave you all with is to remember that even though, yes, there is darkness in the world. Yes, there are dark forces but they are not more powerful than you. You are powerful. Because here's the thing, in our society, mm -hmm. we've been groomed and raised since we were children to believe that there are authority figures that are more powerful than us. When we were children, it was our parents, it was our teachers, it was our um ministers at church or whatever, we were supposed to look to them for the answers. So as children, we were raised believing that others are more powerful than us. But mm. now as adults, our job is to work on remembering before that brainwashing and conditioning, remember who you <laughs> really are, that there is no entity or power that is more powerful than you. You are not to give your power away to any entity. And if you do happen to come under attack by anything, it is going to play a mind game to make you scared and think that it's more powerful than you. And that is purely a mind game because you are powerful. If you weren't powerful, this thing wouldn't be trying to mess with you. Hmm. That's how it works. So remember how powerful you are. And then uh, again, I'll circle back to recommending the Psychic Attack source book because that has way more information than I can even go into today, all about exactly all of the tactics of the dark forces. The more you know about the tactics of negative entities and the dark forces in general on the planet, the more you understand about how all of that works, the, uh, the more you have the upper hand, you'll see, oh, I see this nonsense. I'm not going to get sucked into it. I see exactly what's happening. So mm -hmm. the more you know about the, the dark forces, the tactics, and then also the book has a lot of step-by-step -step processes for what you can do on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis to have really good spiritual hygiene, which we all need to. We all need to brush our teeth take a shower every day. Like we need physical hygiene. We need spiritual hygiene as well. And what to do if you do happen to come under any kind of spiritual attack, the book tells you exactly what to do to clear it. Mm. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, how can we find you? What are some of your uh, links? Mm. Yeah. So um, there's a few different places where you can find me. The first is my website, Psychic Protection sanctuary.com. And if that's the one thing you write down, you'll find everything on there. But there's also a free Facebook group that's called Psychic Protection Sanctuary Facebook group. I also have a YouTube channel called Psychic Protection Sanctuary. And then I also have books on Amazon and Audible. And so you can just do a search for Maya Zahira. Um, 
And I think that's about it. I'm also, I'm all over social media. I'm on TikTok, Maya Jane Zahira. Um, so, and I have a ton of, ton of videos on YouTube, lots of videos. If you want to binge watch and learn all about how, how all of this stuff works, you can swing yeah. on over there. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll uh, mm-hmm. definitely upload all that when I upload our video. So yeah, I appreciate thanks. it. Appreciate you coming on. I really do. And it, mm. it, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I appreciate you as well. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And I'll, I'll end it with a Paramahansa Yogananda quote, if you don't mind. And he said, um, the evidence of evil is here in the world. You cannot deny it. It is there. Why would, if there was, if there was no evil, why would Jesus say, pray, pray, lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He is saying plainly that evil exists. So the truth is we find evil in the world. And, um, thank you for broadening our awareness and, and with your experience and your insights about evil. Uh, in the world because we can become blinded to that and it's all about love and but in truth is there's a lot of suffering and what's causing the suffering so thank you thank you boo boo thank you take care <laughs>